Hi, I'm Dan Primack, and welcome to Axios Recap, where we dig into one big story. Today is Monday, June 28th. Juul will pay up for targeting teens. Mount Everest climbers say they've come down with COVID, and we're focused on the Pacific Northwest's heat dome. Temperatures in Portland, Oregon today are expected to break the all-time record that was set just yesterday when the high was 112 degrees. Now, this isn't just about people being sweaty and uncomfortable. Buildings and infrastructure in the Pacific Northwest are not designed for this sort of heat, as evidenced by a photo of transit power cables literally melting. And even if you're in the minority of people in a city like Seattle that actually have air conditioning, a recent drought has sapped much of the hydroelectric power used to run it. So what's happening? Well, the basic scientific explanation is this is a so-called heat dome, or a very strong high-pressure system that's basically sitting over the region, in which the sinking air heats on its way down to Earth. There's also some unfortunate geography in play, in which air blowing around this heat dome is moving from east to west, and as it does so, the air descends from mountainous regions to the coasts, warming as it goes. In fact, the heat dome is so strong, and the temperature so unusual, that this is an event that could only be expected to occur once every couple thousand years. But as researchers tell my colleague Andrew Friedman, climate change is making these kinds of rare events hotter and also more common and more protracted. Short term, this is a public health emergency because extreme heat can be a killer. Longer term, it's about climate change and how we build or rebuild where we live and work. In 15 seconds, we'll talk with Axios climate reporter Andrew Friedman about what's happening in the Pacific Northwest, what systems could be on the verge of failure, and if we can no longer think of these as once-in-a-lifetime events. But first, this. This episode is brought to you by PayPal and CVS. No matter what you need, a thermometer, lotion, toothpaste, electric blue hair dye, you can earn a little money back at CVS. Get $10 back in your PayPal or Venmo wallet on your first transaction of $20 or more when you pay in-store with the PayPal or Venmo app. Now, what you buy with that is up to you. Maybe some hair loss treatment or tanning oil? Offer can be modified or terminated at any time. See terms at paypal.com slash cvs. We're joined now by Andrew Friedman, an Axios climate and energy reporter. Andrew, can you give us a sense of what it's like on the ground in the Pacific Northwest right now? You know, it's hard to. People that I've been talking to you have described it as... Essentially a furnace-like environment that they have just absolutely have no memory of. That this is, it's not even a dry heat in the Northwest. The dew points, uh, which is what really determines how humid it feels, are quite high. They're almost as high as the East Coast in the United States right now. So the heat index is a factor. So you can't even take comfort in the fact that it's a dry heat, which you normally can, you know, in the West. So it it feels absolutely miserable out there. Does it get better at night? The thing is, it's not getting better at night. And that is what is a major public health concern. If the temperature at night does not drop below about 78 degrees Fahrenheit, the public health risks dramatically increase because people's bodies aren't getting enough time of relief from the heat to essentially recharge themselves. So you have a greater risk of heat illness and heat stroke after a couple of days in which you have overnight lows of 78 or above and daytime highs in the upper 90s to low 110s. Is the pandemic having an impact on how cities and towns in the Pacific Northwest are able to offer shelter from this heat? You know, the pandemic, I think, is not as great a factor now than previously. Like when we dealt with hurricane disasters in the Gulf Coast last season, there were all these concerns about how many people do you let into shelters and do they have to socially distance? It seemed like officials in Oregon and in Washington state were pretty aggressive in opening cooling shelters. They've been aggressive in opening large ones, too, like the Portland Convention Center, for example. This is supposed to happen, what, once every thousand or once every couple thousand years, but not even get this hot. Can you just give a sense, how unusual is it what we're seeing right now? You know, it's hard to, uh, it is hard 
to statistically nail this down as to how rare this is. If you go by the strength of the heat dome itself, so the strength of the high pressure center sitting over the Pacific Northwest in British Columbia, it's about one in 10,000 years frequency. If you look at just the historical record going back until the late 1800s in the Pacific Northwest, it's completely unprecedented. So we're not just breaking record. Normally, when you break an all-time heat record, you break it by a fraction of a degree or a degree or two. We are breaking records out there by 5 to 10 degrees Fahrenheit, all-time records. From your perspective, does global warming play into that? Global warming absolutely is playing into this. Global warming makes heat waves more likely to occur. It makes them more severe. It makes them more prolonged. There have been numerous studies in a field of climate change science known as climate extreme event attribution, where they look at an atmosphere with greenhouse gases and without and try to recreate this event in each uh, simulation. And in most of these studies, they've come out and said, well, you couldn't really get this result at all unless you include these greenhouse gases. Does that mean we need to stop almost thinking about this in a once every 10,000 years or 1,000 years because we're just going to get more of these and they're, the unusual part is kind of fading away, whether it be in the Pacific Northwest or elsewhere? Yeah, I, I think, uh, you know, in our coverage at Axios, we haven't focused so much on like the frequency statistic, partly for that reason, because although it's it, this is extraordinarily rare, these extraordinarily rare events are becoming more and more common. The definition of a normal climate has changed. So the way they've built Everything in the Pacific Northwest needs to be shifted based on what the climate is doing now. And I would just say these types of events, I've been talking to climate scientists over the past couple of days, and I've been texting with fellow weather journalists, so total nerds on a text chain. We're all unsettled. Like, I felt a pit in my stomach for the past couple of days watching the model data come in and get hotter and hotter and watching the observations come in matching that model data. At first, everybody in the weather community thought that the models were smoking something, that we were missing something, that the, that the computer models were cluing into something that didn't really exist or they were exaggerating it in some way. And in fact, to see them turn up the heat as the events got closer and closer, when normally the opposite happens, was very unnerving. And it's unnerving to see this play out. And it doesn't mean that we've crossed a threshold into a completely new climate in which this happens every year. But it means that threshold behavior socially using, like, think about it just in human terms, we are having more events now that exceed our capability to adapt, exceed our vulnerability limits, our design limits, if you will. Is that similar to what you think we saw in Texas a couple months ago when instead of record heats, they were having record colds? It's similar in the sense that we have not designed our systems with enough resiliency to handle the climate that we now find ourselves in. Um, but in Texas, that was a very known issue that they could have dealt with ahead of time. Whereas in uh, the Pacific Northwest, yeah, it was forecast quite well and they have implemented cooling shelters. But there's a lot of concerns about the most vulnerable populations in cities like Seattle and Portland. There are large homeless populations in both of these cities, for example. The fact that Canada set a national heat record of all time, it was the hottest any location in Canada has ever been, which was 116 degrees Fahrenheit, beating the old record by three degrees Fahrenheit. And if you know Canada at all, you do not expect that record to be set in British Columbia. You expect that to be set in Alberta or Saskatchewan. And it was set in British Columbia in June. Andrew, you're sitting in Washington, D.C. 
Do you think what we're seeing in the Pacific Northwest with so many systems on the verge of collapse puts more momentum, political momentum, behind President Biden's infrastructure plan? Yeah, I, I think this all does play into the infrastructure conversation, possibly at the same time as you're having that conversation come out of the horrible building collapse in Florida. Both of these things are kind of coming together and making, I think, Americans think about, well, their built environment around them and how they're living their lives and how uh, less than half of people in Seattle of residents have air conditioning and you're going to see a run on air conditioning in Seattle. So there definitely is some element of that that may play into it, but it's not going to be the dominant thing that's going to determine the course of this politically. You talk about a run on air conditioners in Seattle. What what other sorts of infrastructure is straining right now or risking collapse? So Portland's light rail system is shut down. And part of that is due to the stability of rail tracks when they get above a certain temperature. So you'll notice that in the Northeast Corridor, when Amtrak has to slow down all of their trains when it gets into the upper 90s and low 100s, because the, the railways aren't as sturdy in those, in those circumstances. Most people probably wouldn't think of that. Like, oh, well, light rail is going to have to turn the shutdown because it's too hot. But that has happened. There's other things. Aviation has a climate change vulnerability, not just because airports like LaGuardia are located next to the ocean and flood, but also because airports with relatively short runways, when it gets really hot, an airplane requires more runway distance to take off. And they're having to take off some luggage. They're having to limit the number of people that can be on a plane to take off just at certain airports where pilots in running their calculations before they take off realize that they need more runway than they actually have. You talk about infrastructure, which is kind of public spend. Is the private supply chain ready for this, you know, run on air conditioners or even look, this system dumped a ton of rain on Michigan, which caused things to be flooded, but we don't have enough rental cars for people whose cars were submerged. Yeah, I, I think right now there is a supply chain crunch. There's a total supply chain crunch nationally and internationally. So the answer right now is probably no. The answer in a normal non-pandemic, post-pandemic, whatever period we are in on the pandemic situation is probably a little bit better. But just in time, delivery of most things in the United States does not lend itself to being a resilient system in general. How does this weather event change how we think about what it'll take to overhaul American cities and to make them more resilient, as you suggested? I think and I hope it makes people realize just how much work lies ahead and the necessity of acting now. I mean, if you look at temperature projections, even if we were to slash greenhouse gas emissions to zero today, we would still be in for several decades more of climate change and then stabilizing the climate at a warmer level than we are at right now. So things like this would still be happening, even though we, quote unquote, took care of the problem. Andrew, final question for you. You said earlier that these events are changing how we think of normal climate. Can scientists still accurately predict when these sorts of severe events will happen to even give us an attempt to prepare in real time? You know, that's a really good question. And the question that I've started to ask meteorologists more and more is, are our weather models capable of anticipating unforeseen events? The last time that I had that sense looking at computer model projections and thinking, oh my God, that, that has to be wrong. What the heck is that doing? And then it turned out to be right, was looking at the European model seven days, eight days ahead of Hurricane Sandy, because that was not a solution that had ever happened before in recorded history, that left turn uh, into New Jersey. So the response I get from most people is yes, because the physics in these models is correct and does not 
necessarily change, like the underlying physical equations don't change uh, just because you're a little bit warmer now. But there are interactions between soil moisture and fire danger and heat waves that may result in some sort of runaway effects that we didn't program into these models. Andrew Friedman of Axios, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for having me. Welcome back. What we're continuing to watch today is the horrific condo collapse in Surfside, Florida. As of this taping, the death toll has risen to 10 people, with 151 still missing. Rescuers continue to search for survivors, but obviously hopes are fading, as we're now more than four days in. The most important story here is the human tragedy, period. But there are big questions emerging about why this happened, particularly as we've now learned that a 2018 engineering report showed, quote, major structural damage to the concrete slab beneath the building's pool deck and crumbling of the column beams and walls of its underground parking garage. Plus, there's this broader climate change issue that we addressed earlier with Andrew. It's not yet known if the Surfside building's structural damage was caused by saltwater erosion, but we do know that rising temperatures and tides are causing major infrastructure problems in coastal cities like Miami, and that it's only going to become a bigger problem as time goes on. For updates on the story, we're covering it at Axios.com. And we're done. Big thanks for listening. And to my producers, Naomi Shaven, Sabina Sangani, and Alex Sugiar. Please be sure to leave us a review. And if you're not already subscribed to or following the podcast, please do so. Have a great national Paul Bunyan Day. And we'll be back tomorrow with another Axios Recap.